All righty, no problem. I've been going around like a headless chicken, so a lot of stuff has been shoved onto you know a very very long finger. Can everybody hear me? Hello. Yes. Oh, great. Will I start now yes. then? Can everybody see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. Excellent. All righty, I'm going to continue. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity of doing this. As I said um, initially, just a few minutes ago, I, as a person, I am face blind. Um, I don't know if people know what that means. I actually didn't even realize that I was face blind until I was in my 40s. I thought that it was the case that everybody else was the exact same, that nobody recognized people, um, you know, their faces, that it was, um, you know, a common thing that you couldn't hold a memory of a face. And I have that condition and it's made my life immeasurably difficult. You just, you don't understand what it's like until you have it. So maybe that is a part of the way I'm built internally and the way I am um, fixated on self-identity or the idea, you know, the uh, global identity really. Um, my opening photograph there shows you um, scalistically how big or large or small my work is by comparison to, you know, yourself or myself or anyone else. They're not huge, although I have been asked and commissioned to make them larger and I'm still working on that. I'm going to move on to the first one and I'm going to spend less time on my earlier work. Um, we moved down here to the Hook Peninsula um, in 2008. I am from about 15 minutes drive up the road. Paul is from about two minutes drive up the road and we're still blow-ins in Churchtown, if you know what I mean, because the idea of identity and being tied to a place in rural Ireland is very tight little thing. They're very tight communities. They're not really welcoming of strangers now, to be honest. And we were initially kind of looked on as a coronavirus equivalent. But anyway, um, I became immersed in the landscape of the area where we live in and my daily walks along the coastline, which is just a couple of meters down from our garden here. And I started to look and see driftwood. And it was exactly the same as um, the other artist that you have that uses driftwood. When he was talking about his work, um, having a sense of a physicality to it, you know, a sense of a history, um, an origin. I felt the exact same way about that in 2014. So I started to incorporate it into my work. And, you know, the idea of having seahorses came to my mind. And I wanted to give a, a kind of a feeling of um, nobility and aloofness and like as if they're living in the canopy of the, the woodlands or the forest where they inhabit. And again, you can see capillaries or branches joining legs to give the idea of connections, you know, as many or as less as they were having within their existence. Um, moving on, that's just the smaller versions of the crested tree horses. Um, these ones in particular are made from pulp and driftwood. The ones preceding it are made from resin. They're steel embedded into the driftwood to add strength because the taller and the larger they are. They're in height. They are, let's see, 130 centimeters high. So they're, they're relatively tall. <coughs> and these guys here are averaging out at about 76 centimeters in height. So they're small, but you get the idea of when they're in groups or they're together, they're forming a, a canopy of a woodland area. And I wanted to have that connectivity between them, this idea that they were forming their own tribe. And if you notice as well, their faces, it's resting horse face. When we move on, good grief, to the next one. This is where I started to notice specifics in the coastline around the edges here that I wasn't seeing in other areas, other strands around the area of the peninsula. And I found out that the holes and the caverns and the kind of the tunnel-like indentations from erosions in the rocks was known as um, Tifoni. And I thought, God, that's too fantastic to ignore. 
And I wanted to embody that in the trait or the personality, the characteristics of my seahorses so that they were literally almost of the rock from the area. And again, the resting horse face disappeared to get a bit more animated so that you would have a bit of you know, energy and personality in there. This is a second, um, these are called earth horses because I wanted them to be, you know, literally from the earth. And individually they're called superposition one, the taller one, and the smaller one, superposition super two. The reason I call them superposition is because it's a scientific affair that basically means that some object that can be two things simultaneously at the same time. And I thought it, it covered me perfectly or, you know, like people who are not confident inside and that you're presenting something else to the others around you. So you're literally what you are on the inside and the identity or the, you know, projection that you're showing other people. So you're two things at the one time in the one object. So there's superposition one and superposition two. This here is um, very quickly something that I thought of after storms here. We're open to the Atlantic storms coming in here the whole time. And I started to notice that um, after every storm, rocks would be broken from, you know, boulders being trashed around. And all these shards and layers were being revealed that had fossil patterns embedded in them. And I thought that they were masterpieces on their own and in their own for their own sake. But also, what better could represent me or a person, humans, that, you know, you are literally the history of the events in your life, the layers of events and experiences. And so my figures here, this is called journeyman totem pod. So they're in a pod, a seed pod for traveling so that they can disperse a bit like, you know, we traveled five minutes down the road to be here. But, you know, your, who you are on the inside goes with you wherever you are. You've got that sense of origin and it never leaves you. Okay. Next. This here, I still was doing a few horses. And again, you can see here the idea of the legs of the horse. All that um, texturing. I used to go down to the coastal ledge and what I'd do is I'd take moulds of the fossil patterns, the ones that I thought were the nicest, I'd come back and I would take casts of those and then incorporate them into my work. So the horse has that as well as around the torso, so there's holes and caverns to, you know, carry on the Tifoni erosion. And here is where I started to unify nature and humans together. You can see the legs are in, encircling the body, the torso of the, the trunk of the body completely. So, you know, nature and humans becoming one um, with each other and with their origins or their landscape. This here was developing the idea of a journey generation. It's kind of a bit like, um, you know, the Irish and the famine or you know, people having to leave war and torn countries or emigration for work or what have you, you know, moving as a body of strangers to somewhere else. And it's not a journey that's easier taken lightly. So with this piece here, I actually based it on um, Schellig Michael, which is almost a, a, a pyramid shaped island off the coast of Ireland. And actually Star Wars used it to film some of their scenes in one of their films and it was notoriously difficult for them to get permission to do it but also to actually get onto the island because you enter it by getting into a series of steps that entwine up through the rocks they're actually carved into the rocks so i wanted to get the idea of that if you look at the long piece of driftwood on the right hand side you can see little protuberances they're a bit like mushroom shaped fungi that grows around the bases of trees and woodlands. And that is encircling that whole length going up um, to kind of symbolize the difficulty and the steepness of the journey. Um, 
the trial that it would be to go from one place to another, that it's not a difficult decision to reach, nor is it a difficult um, or an easy journey to endure. I have a few um, seagulls in there as well to you know, represent this idea of loneliness, but also hope because when you're at sea, you see seagulls, you know, land is close. Those long branches of driftwood, I hollowed them out and I embedded steel rods into all of it. So it's, you know, driftwood becomes more drier and brittle and lighter as it ages. And I decided to make sure that that wasn't going to become a fragile piece in this work. It's about six foot in height. So, you know, it's difficult enough. And the um, base, the rock is granite and it can be removed in three pieces. So, you know, you lift that sculpture up and off it, but it's attached by bolts so that it can go outside or inside as a piece. We move on. This is again my Journeyman pod series. And you can see there how I went with the, the pod, the idea of inherent danger from within and without, that, um, you know, life is filled with hazards. Now, I still like the idea of horses and um, I just try to inject a little bit of classical beauty and nobility and give a little bit of tension or drama. And my sense of identity was to architecture. And this is where I started getting the idea of introducing some symbolism. And um, you can see the tails and the manes of the horses are based on the tops of pillars that would have been done the Corinthian pillars where they're very ornate. And I'll just move on to another one, which is the Ionic pair. And if you look at the base of their tails and their manes, you can see the simplicity of the scroll shape that's typical of the Ionic columns. And this one here is the Doric columns. And this is an awful lot more restful and relaxed because the pillar, the Doric pillars are an awful lot more pared back and simplified and, you know, easy. So that's what they are. Helen, yeah. I'm, Helen, I'm going to interrupt for just a second. There are a couple of people, I think, waiting to join us. Can you just admit no them? Can you just admit them? Excellent. How do I do that? Because Paul is after disappearing out of the room for a second. Sorry, I'm sorry. It's under participants at the bottom and it will just say admit. No, 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 no. Okay, well done. I'm, I'm just going to get Paul. For That's okay. That's okay. Just you can go ahead and continue. I'm back again. Can you allow participants? Yeah, uh, hopefully. Join the conversation. Participants. Admit. Oh, phew. Come on. So they're the three people that you just need to allow them in. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Hello, Noel. Hello, Rosie. Okay. <laughs> my my technician has come in and sorted the problem out. Great. Thanks a million. Sorry, don't want to interrupt you, but just you keep going. All righty. Now, I have just started on the figurative element within my work because earlier, what you've seen so far were very simplified, rudimentary, primitive shapes for the figures where their bodies were just purely the fossil, you know, like they were made from the fossils or the rock. But what I wanted to do was to get a bit more realism in there. So this is the first figure that I did that was actually based on reality. But it was also the first figure where I introduced the idea of presenting yourself, um, wearing a costume to the rest of society that surrounds you. And I also wanted to introduce a little bit of symbolism as well. Um, in the form of the Doc Martin boots so that the spectator would be able to look at it and know that 
there was a dichotomy between the costume and the actual bootwear, the footwear. So, you know, it was obvious that they weren't on the same timeline, that this is not a piece from history that she is dressed up as and presenting herself to the world as this kind of um, classical, you know, nobility. Her hair, I started to introduce the idea of amalgamating nature with figures. And I started to make hairstyles look like horns of animals, um, you know, to kind of have a, a crossbreed, if you were. And um, that's basically it. I also wanted to keep my horses with their um, animated, you know, features to, you know, try and get a bit of life or energy or attitude into my pieces that she may be looking soft and tranquil and calm like. But is the horse actually speaking for her, showing what's on the inside? Now, this lady is the Snapdragon dress, the girl with the Snapdragon dress. And she was my very first piece where I, I came up with the idea of using an architectural construct to symbolize an encasement or um, being entrapped in something or submerged in something. It's a bit like if you were a friend to the mafia and you crossed them and you done did them wrong and you were going to end up wearing a concrete suit and swimming with the fishes or sinking with the fishes. So this is what this skirt symbolizes. It's not a style of you know fashion, but it's actually something that the figure is submerged into and is encased by. And it's also the place where I actually had no arms attaching the hands to the shoulders. So if the spectator looks at that and they can wonder why, because if you were to go and wrap your two hands up in snappy wrap for the day, see how difficult you are to try and, you know, do things to be helpful, to be in various situations and to get out of it, or to even just keep your balance. Um, also, this piece here shows the idea of um, nature motifs coming out in my pieces. You can see that the hair, again, is based on the idea of horns and animals, but also guised as, you know, fashion, you know, hair. In the body, you can see that the snapdragon seeds are coming out of her dress. So it's this idea of being enveloped by nature and being nurtured by nature, being lost in something that's not judgmental, that's all <clears throat> embracing and encompassing, and the joy coming out, you know, that you reflect what you are submerging yourself in. So she's a special person to me. The spectator can look at this and look at it as a piece of fashion, and that the nature motifs are a guise of fashion ornamentation. But if they're good at reading symbolism or questioning things, they might think, you know, that there's something else going on there. And also the Snapdragon seed pods, I made them to look like eyes, you know, so, you know, that you're conscious under the stare of society. These three lassies are more or less the same idea, you know, being submerged in nature, that you are camouflaged and that you're afraid to be seen as being the outsider. I'm also introducing the element of birds and nests. I started to have a personal narrative going through and um, and the idea that um, you know maternity and mother nature and what have you. So I'll move on quickly from there. This one here, it's not a very clear photograph, but she's got a, a steampunk kind of mask on her face with the beak. And the idea was, I wasn't finished the piece before it. If you look at the piece on the right hand side, she that's her. She wasn't wearing a mask, but I wasn't happy. And I went back and I reworked on her, you know, when she finally came back to my studio. And I wanted the message to be a little more clear that she didn't want to be found out as being the odd one out within that group. 
that the disguise had to be, you know, a bit more thorough. Moving along. Oh, by the way, that's all 23 karat gold leaf on all of these pieces. And if you can see this one here, she's called Girl with the Rose Dress. They're like three dimensional paintings and everything is made in different stages, um, which we can get back to and discuss during the questions and answers, I suppose. Um, her hair in this one here, I wanted that on purpose to look a little bit reminiscent of Eastern temples so that people would have an idea of the figures being associated subliminally with uh, temples of worship or sacred places or something of spiritual you know, nature, you know, that your body is a temple. And literally the roses are growing out through her. It's not just that she has a fashionable dress that's covered in roses. What she is submerged in is coming through and out in her. If you're in a happy situation, you emanate happiness. You know, so submerge yourself in something that's positive. This now is a photograph that I put up here just purely because I love it. It reminds me of a pre-Raphaelite piece of work or a painting. They're all wistful, they're all very romanticized, yet if you look carefully into the symbolism in it, it's a hard realistic subject portrayed, you know, with a romantic kind of edge to it. If you also take a note of the girls on the left hand side, you'll see that they weren't finished being painted and they appear in another picture fairly soon. So you'll see that their makeup is put on, just like I put on makeup, especially for today. There's again, submerged in nature. Oceanic pebble dress is on the left and the remembrance dress with poppies is on the right. Or reverse that third the other way around okay these are daisy chain golden girls and this is the idea of um introducing this thing of twins or you know mirroring yourself finding your doppelganger find, finding your um kindred spirit because you know feeling like you're apart from everybody and that you're different from everybody and trying to hide from the world when you find somebody that you don't have to pretend to be somebody else in their company. It's a celebration. And so I introduce, you know, a mirror like, you know, you have met your own reflection. And the idea of the chain is introduced in two ways. One is the chains, the daisy chain that's going around and they're in low relief and they're coming out. I've drilled back into it and then built them out over the actual encasement of the architectural dress. Then the idea of the chain is again where the two figures are literally chained like a, you know, a chain necklace, a gold piece of chain. So, and again, they're wearing their costumes and their costumes reflect nature. This is where I started to introduce a personal element to my journey. And I wanted it to be a little bit more oblique that the casual spectator wouldn't be hit in the face by you know my history and my story because the artist's job is to actually make the art and the spectator's job is to put the story or the narrative to it so you don't have to you know have everything out there for them to have it too easy because if it's too easily seen and understood the art ceases to be alive if they walk away and have to wonder why was that like that that's a successful piece of art. So why is pears and poppies standing there holding an armful of pears and having, you know, poppy dress? What, what's the reasoning behind that? There is a reason for it. And again, knots and crosses is beside her. Some of those knots have dents that are, you know, drilled in. So they've been taken away. Um, and it's up to the spectator to actually be aware of that because when you look at it initially, you don't see, you think the surface is all flat, but it's not. And, you know, there's history in these pieces, it's personal history, but, you know, it's not in your face. Moving along. These three ladies, again, another personal narr narrative, um, but the main reason for these or the main difference is the fact that I have the architectural construct that they're embedded in 
animated or twisted. I wanted to get in a sense of freedom, of graceful movement. So they're not straight and defiant like those two are defiant and they're standing there and they're daring. You come here and these are very graceful, very elegant. There's a sense of movement and peace and enjoyment and freedom. However, they don't have any hands. They're completely embedded. Okay, and if the spectator looks carefully at it, they'll, they'll see little hints in it. Um, from left over to right, you have My Little Blueberry, Secret in the Center, and Open on the right. And the spectator can make of that what they will. This one here is just showing you how color plays a role in my work. And I noticed that color actually hid an awful lot of the silence, the suspension, the isolation, the, you know, the, in, the, intern, the inward atmosphere that I wanted to create. And so these guys, you know, they create that. So that's why my color palette changed. Now, if you look at this fella here, these are called herder family. I tend to work in groups of threes normally. Um, this group grew to a group of five containing six individual pieces like, but I tend to group things. They work as um, an individual piece on their own, in their own right. But when you put a few of them together, it's like radio waves that are overlapped and they interact and the picture becomes for, far clearer for the spectator and the narrative expands. So the spectator can actually pick up more clues depending on the individual pieces that are interacting within a certain amount of space. It adds uh, an air of tension and drama to a piece as well. And it's, it, it saves me having to explain the work when you see a couple of different pieces put together. Now, if I move on, you're going to see that this is called herd pair. I specifically chose the goats on purpose as the animal to be integrated here in this tribe where people have met their kindred spirits and they're accepted for who they are and can be themselves. They reflect nature and the love of acceptance. Um, the animals, goats, when I went and Googled them, so that I could know which animal I wanted to have. Um, the stuff attached to goats is gentleness, shyness, being friendly. They've got a strong sense of justice and they have a very kind heart nature. And I thought that's exactly people who don't fit in. It's not because they're ax murderers all the time. It's because they don't know how to relate to other people. Their internal history has been different to others. Their personal experiences separates them from other people. And what I have here, if you look at the figure on the right, she has the goats within her skirt or that structure. Um, and it's supposed to be reflectant of her character as well. And the idea of self-love, that you know, you also have to love yourself and care for yourself the same way as these herders within the tribe are caring for their goats. That's, um, I put on the gold leaf as well onto these because I thought, you know, it, it needed, this kind of personal identity and attention needs to have quality and, you know, to be, to be shine, to be made important. Now, this is the piece that within that group, the others were done in 2017. This was started at the end of 2017 and I finished it in 2019. It's the pivotal piece of, the, of that group. It's where it all came together and I finally realized what it was about. And this is the herder's embrace. You are not born or made as a lone single individual, but you are the sum of every person who has surrounded you and affected you in your life for good or bad. And those lines are etched into the surface 
to ref reflect the fabric of life and those faces are coming out in relief you know the important people that you know affected who you became as an adult because this all forms when you're a child traits behaviors thought patterns they're ingrained when you're a child and they only become amplified as you're an adult and they they form who you become as a, as a person in your adult life i included here as well the the gold dots to highlight the idea that you know there's golden moments as well as those dark areas you know where life isn't good but you can see there the edges where the noses are coming out and again i liked my doc martin boots and there they are all together in the same space creating a, 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 an amped up volume of this idea of being part of a tribe, being with your kindred spirits, your soulmates. Now this piece here, I worked in three, and these are two that went into the RUA together. Um, I held the third one back and I was sorry I did that afterwards. These two were bought by the Arts Council in Northern Ireland and they're part of a perpetual, a perpetual traveling tour around the North. So I'm delighted with that. It means people and children will get to see this work. And it's where I decided to, instead of look at identity from an adult point of view, to look back to the root of where you are formed as a person, the building blocks that turn you and make you and um, show who you become. Okay. Um, um, all these things that happen in your world, your internal landscape, they become normalized. And what you see as being normal may not be normal to other people. So it depends on your internal landscape and your history, your experiences as a spectator, whether you can read into this work and identify with it or, or have a, a connection with it. Um, they can be hard to look at. That's the third one she's after appearing over on the left-hand screen. When all those doors are closed, these three pieces look you know, not too disturbing. Um, the one on the left-hand side is called um, Inside I'm Drowning But No One Sees. Well, when you open up the doors, it says, but no one sees. And the external surface has engraved ripples so that it looks like it's, you know, the surface of a pond with just a little bit of rippling. But when you open it up, you can see the storm that's all going on underneath the surface. And again, on the right hand side, the um, not me piece, it's the adult. And on the inside of the door, I have little kind of scribbles, a bit like what you'd see on the doors of toilets in public places where people graffiti. And it's, you know, little things that were going on during the year that that was happening and you know motifs that were important to me and again you've got the child she's called see nothing hear nothing tell no one you can see that i am totally driven by my emotional need to get a message across i would be a lazy artist if I was to do a subject matter that hadn't a personal connection to me where I feel driven to do it. This, These two here mark the beginnings of me using bronze because again I wanted to elevate this subject. I wanted to shine a light on this subject and for people who have an internal topography like I do that they would find um, a connection when they see it that you would automatically be able to identify with it. Um, I've used childlike props in there, the banana, the emoji face, to keep it current and keep a link with you know today's culture with children and you know the idea of children and simplified things. You know, things are not complicated, they, they can't deal with things in an adult way. You can only do that in hindsight as an adult. Um, the left hand figure is called to be or not to be. The right hand figure is called impending. 
um, you can see that they've got the architectural restraint or construct that's preventing 100% freedom of movement. I've introduced the symbolism of a plinth to try and get the idea of standing on an ice edge, trying to balance while not having your hands to cope. And then the impending one is this idea of doom and impending that's, you know, storm is coming, there's trouble brewing, you can sense it and you're powerless to do anything and you just have to ride it through until it's gone and then it happens again. It depends on your environment. Oh yeah, I forgot to say the masks on these are all animated. They're on hinges, they actually open and close. The foundry had problems and didn't like the idea of me wanting to have them animated, but I wanted that when they're closed, you see one thing, when they're open, you see something different. Now, I'm moving on to Minimized. I think her title actually tells you what it's like, what the meaning of this is. It's about your internal landscape as a child and how you have been treated from around you making you feel that you are less than you should be and less than you are, that you've been minimized on the inside. When that mask is closed, that looks almost like a childlike, happy, playful, dancey piece. She's on her little piece of a truncated cheese that isn't even connected to the ground. So it's not only on a, a, a kind of a knife edge that she's trying to balance, but her foundations aren't even um, you know, set properly. So um, I think this is a very strong piece. And it, it actually, my work does not just come kind of, it doesn't interact with just people that, you know, children that have had a hard life or a hard background or have been treated badly. It, it can be um, any kind of trauma that somebody has endured, all types of hardships, people from different backgrounds can go through. Essentially, it all boils down to the same type of internalized emotions that affect your person and who you are. And you know, you can connect with it. Now here, I put this in on purpose because all of you know bronze. Bronze is usually good for only abstract, simplified objects. The foundry were not happy when they saw me coming with this. And this is what I got from the foundry. This is what it's like. That's the artist proof. That's the same piece that was in that photograph a second ago. When I get the bronzes into my studio, I have to actually work on them more with enamels to bring the life out in them. White as a patina in a foundry is, you know, a death knell. It's not a good patina to ask for at all. So I found that I had to resort to, you know, treating the surface myself at home and putting on gold leaf as well and the enamels. So within the small editions that I do, and I work in editions of six, nine and 15, and the number of editions has to do with number one, whether I think anybody would want to purchase them. And number two, how expensive they are to actually have made. And then I need to have a higher edition to recoup the, the money back over a period of time because the amount of money I make on these is very little. It's not worth it at all. But but I need to have the elevation of this subject matter in the material and that down the line in decades to come, when I'm not here, that these pieces are still here to be looked at and questioned by whoever sees them. So there is what comes to me out of the foundry. There's the first edition of this one. It's in behind me if you want to see that at a later stage. But you can see how within an edition, the finishes can all be unique. They're actually unique pieces. And there it is again within a group of three. And this is called um, Altered State. So the actual collective title gives the spectator an idea of what the subject matter might be about or what the artist is trying to say. Um, on the left hand side, you can see um, the Mickey Mouse pairing to Minnie Mouse and his name is deleted and rewritten. 
you can see there that the architectural constructs or the frames that are impeding his freedom of movement have positive um, dialogue on it and negative dialogue. And he's actually erasing and editing, self-editing because of his environment and his experiences and all the, you know, being confident, being joyous, being creative, being interested, being motivated, all rubbed out and nothing but negative left to fill that void. On the right hand side, you have Morph and that's um, a dialogue again about going to nature and enveloping yourself in nature and wanting to be come someone else. Here again, White Rabbit is on the left. And again, balancing on a pinpoint, this idea of that they are not on the same playing pitch as everybody else, that their internal landscape is like a, a war zone instead of somebody else's internal landscape being like a tropical forest. And that they, they look at this and they can't see, they can't identify on a personal level at all. Because if you've been brought up and surrounded by different attitudes, your mind is not wired that way. And this is all in your head. And it would be like, you can give up smoking, as I have, and drinking, as I have. And you can cut out certain foods. There's loads of things that you can try to try and change your life. But trying to change your personality and your way of thinking and those ingrained traits that you've practiced and practiced all of your life and you've believed, it's like asking somebody to forget how to walk, how to stop riding a bicycle. You don't know how to ride a bicycle. It's impossible. Throw somebody in the ocean and if they know how to swim, they're going to swim. How do you unlearn? It takes a lot of time and it's not done overnight and you need help. And the thing is, is that when you're in that situation, you don't realize that other people around you have a different internal landscape that, you know, yours is based on a totally different set of ingrained traits that other people have no idea exist. This is an example of a piece that has become a bronze. This is the original done in the resin and steel. And it's just to show you how I have to have pieces come apart and that can only snap back into place in one way so that when they're in the foundry getting cast, that I won't have limbs and stuff attached on at wrong angles. Um, I have to simplify the job because otherwise, like my earlier attempts at getting them to cast things in the foundry was very disheartening. So this means it's an awful lot of hard work. So I have to select which pieces I want to have made in bronze because then as I'm making them, I have to be able to take them apart. This is uh, big on symbolism. As you can see, I have introduced realism in parts of the figure, architectural constructs and symbolism so that the spectator has the ability and the choice to have a variation on the dialogue or their internal narrative, depending on their own experiences and how interested and motivated they are to look at it, to see and to question what, what they're looking at. Um, I can show you that at the base there where the little child's school bag has the two feathers coming out to symbolize the wings of freedom. And she has a little emoji badge attached and her toy bear. That's to anchor it back at the age level that's appropriate for this piece in case people think this is a, you know, an angel, you know, and everyone thinks angels are in their twenties or thirties. This is a child. And that was helping to anchor it into a certain timeline age wise. Then you have hands in that wreath like nest that's, supporting the figure and one is holding the leg and the other is coming out you know to grab or it depends on your internal landscape your history your emotional um, landscape internally as to whether you see this piece as an uplifting heavenly positive piece or if it's something where it could be more negative and you know, preventing you from escaping or reaching your, pu 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 your potential. And 
the next piece shows you it in bronze and I've obviously enhanced it with enamels. And again, you have the white for the innocence and the purity and the silence and invisibility and, you know, for the naivety of um, childhood. Also, I want to have my pieces open to various interpretations, you know, so somebody, depending on how long they look at something and query it. And also, I don't want to have to stay, you know, stand up and tell a spectator or a, an audience what to think about my work, because once you know the background behind it, it stops breathing, it stops living, it becomes part of the wallpaper and the curtains in your home. You, it becomes invisible to you. Whereas if there is air of wonder and symbols and, you know, um, something to make them, you know, think that it could mean one thing or another, it keeps their interest alive. If something is slightly ambiguous, yeah, ambiguous, it, it, it can hook somebody and it gives them space to connect and to personalize and to have their own narrative and not feel that they have to adopt my story. Because my pieces, believe it or not, they I, I take three months minimum to work on one piece, one piece. And over that three months, I'm not thinking the one thing. It evolves and there are so many ideas and so many meanings instilled in each piece that it's impossible for me to actually say, this is what this means. It, it's so much more, but you know, I have to boil it down to the essentials, but there's always much more. Okay, that's just so that you can see the back and the base, that wreath at the bottom, that nest. And again, the morph one, those masks open, they're animated. I wanted to have the hair in the skirt architectural construct there. If you look carefully, you'll see that the hair's legs are embedded into it. They're, they're melding into that skirt. And I wanted to have the question there for the viewer, is she becoming a hair or is the hair becoming her? You know, there's a, a story that somebody can enlarge on. And also the finishes on this, the patinas, you can see that that's, um, let's see, edition four out of 15 and three out of 15. I have 15 in this edition purely because this one was really expensive because of the hairs. You don't want to know how much those hairs cost to have done separately and then combined with the figures. And I had, I nearly had a, a, a cry when I found out how much all my hairs were. Here they are. I spent a long time doing these. They're small, they're fiddly, they're very detailed. I can take up to two weeks on a piece just having the surface area finished, sanding it and you know smoothing it. And if there's an area that isn't correct or smooth, it's, you have to, it's like fresco painting. You have to actually drill out that whole area and then you know, restart again and then sand it down again. You can't just add a small little piece. It's not going to work. So those were very labor intensive and it broke my heart when the foundry told me how much they were costing. And I foolishly, this is a learning step, I foolishly didn't ask how much they were going to cost. I thought that they wouldn't be the outrageous price that they turned out to be. Turned out that they cost too much in time. They're too intricate. They have multiple um, molds and casts and it takes a lot of manpower on the finish so they charged a high price to make sure I wasn't going to come back again with another whole series of them. These are 2020 work that I've just finished. I'm going to go quickly through them because I have a few of them together and I'll talk about them collectively. This one is called Schrodinger's Child. This one is called Disconnected. This one is called Edited. And to put the three of them together, I call them Occlusion. Um, Schrodinger's Child, if you have a cat in the box, according to the theory, during that time it's encased in that box. It can be dead and it can be alive simultaneously, but you don't know until you remove it from the box. The child under that sheet, the sheet represents um, the environment or experiences that that child 
has experienced or is subjected to, once you lift it off, it's anybody's guess as to what that child is going to be. They're at the mercy of society or, you know, the people surrounding them. Snake eyes, though she's standing on dice symbolism. Anybody who knows the Velveteen Rabbit story, she's holding the Velveteen Rabbit. She's holding a small little cat, Schrodinger's cat. Um, I have the skirt that's the architectural construct with the double entry that's very reminiscent of, you know, a cathedral entrance or into an opening into a sacred place. So I wanted that to be foremost in somebody's mind if they read into it deep enough that this is potentially, you know, devastating for a spiritual, pure, innocent temple. Next door, you have your man here on his disconnected building blocks, Lego. And, you know, the building blocks in life, the structures, that they're not quite fitting together properly. The symbolism of the barbed wire, is he keeping people <sighs> away and out? Or is he a prisoner within that? And the simplicity of the box with the little childlike drawing on it is his, you know, childlike front that is presenting to the world. That's his, you know, like his um, emoji or his um, avatar. On the back of that, there's another drawing of a family situation. And I've done them in pencil so that they're temporary, that they're always changing, that life is never consistent. It's never going to be, you know, something that they can relax and enjoy and um, be happy in. The one here on the le on the right hand side is called edited and that one is reminiscent of like um, a self assassination. The hat or the, the mask is a, a paper bag with a lot of phrases and words that if they're used often enough and in repetitive over the decades by people that you hold clear, you know, near to you or you're surrounded by and you believe it eventually, whatever, no matter how ludicrous it becomes you know who you are and the construct that she's encased in has positive and negative affirmations and again they're edited there's a line going through all the positive ones and you've got fearful shy inward angry despairing all of those traits are left unedited so together if you could visualize those in the space and the spectator having the time to question and query and you've got the overlying stories and the wonderment it creates a, an energy these i'm going to fly through them because time is my enemy at the moment just to give you an example that i am a sculptor i am most happiest at sculpting i have the time over three months to be able to change and evolve organically drawing and painting i am not really comfortable with doing it and i only do it when i really have to I admit that I am a lazy drawer and painter, but these are ideas, just to give you a quick idea. To prove I can draw, my husband, my husband. Regression, progression. I don't make political statements normally. This was my political statement. And that's a 2020 piece as well. And I involved the emojis to try and keep it current because the, um, the choice of costume would make you think that it's a, an historical painting, but it's current. And the title Regression Procession kind of tells you about it. And the emojis are supposed to symbolize the people, you know, and some of them asleep on the job, some of them, you know, perplexed and feeling helpless others just not happy and others really happy and the idea of the human well anyway the masks we wear and this is regal vision 2020 hindsight and there you go i have come to the end and i've probably gone way over my time i have I, I apologize how do i give this control back ball i'm finished my presentation now Helen, can you can you return to the whole screen again, if possible? Paul is going to do that. Susan, how much time do we have? I know I'm conscious that we're we're probably very tight on time. I hope everyone hasn't disappeared off home. 
or gone to work or something, how do we get back onto the ordinary screen panel? Oh, hello. Wait. <laughs> hello. <laughs> I have makeup on my way. I even put on perfume for this. We can't see it. We can't see it, Helen. All right, well, um, you, if you put on your video, if you put on your video again, is Susan right. still there? Stop. Sure. Yeah, Great. no, I put it on it. Stop. No. I, can you see me now? Yes. Can you see me now? Yes. Yeah. 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 I even got the scissors to my hair and chopped it from here all the way around. I literally was chopping chunks off, especially for today, so I wouldn't look like I was right through a dozen bushes. Is Susan still here? I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Yes. Susan, yes. how much more time do we have? Because I'm conscious Helen has her work behind her, so the scale of the work is worth right. considering. Right. They open and they close. There's, I think, uh, does anybody have any questions? Or I, I think I've yeah. said kind of everything. Can I say something? Can I say something? Yes. Yeah, it's, Helen, this absolute joy to hear you talk about your work. You have the most beautiful speaking voice. Um, which is very relaxing to listen to. But apart from that, to hear you describe the work, I mean, it's, it's just your work has so many different qualities. It's beautiful. It can be brutal in its messages. It's got all these different things going on. So rich and so inspirational. And I'm so happy to have watched this today because, you know, it's, it's like getting into a gallery, but also hearing what the artist has to say. And I am buzzing now after hearing you speak about your work because I just absolutely love it and I think you're the best sculptor in Ireland so there you go. Thank right. you! Absolutely. Susan, how much time do we have left? Well we're actually over time now but if we can take a few questions quickly. Um, okay. Tony? Tony? Uh, yeah I'll go. Hey, you do a great job of really balancing the, the narrative context in your work. There's a lot in there and it, it's not too much. Great. Uh, I, I work with artists for a living and we're always talking about ways to elevate to um, the next step in their career, but about five years ahead of that. Bronze is a really good example and your work has a lot of negative space and inclusions that make bronze an incredible challenge. Um, you didn't really have enough time to address it, I'm sure, but what were some of the, the largest or, or most intense considerations that you faced when you were considering how to transition your work to bronze? Were you building these projects with the, the, the foundry in mind or did that become a bigger part of? But initially, what were your challenges? I'm still up to here in those challenges, obviously. Um, I didn't think in terms of what, how simplified the work should be. I just wanted to have the the expensive material that would be valued if even if they didn't value the message and my artistry that they would value at least the, the material that it was made in and it was an absolute nightmare like the very first piece that they had done i had to bring it home with me and get my own tools and start carving and etching and shaping it because they said that it wasn't possible and then when i brought it up again I said, there, you see? And then they said, all right. And I said, well, if I can do that, your specialty is this, you should be able to do it. And I kind of, I disliked having to be so forward with them because it felt like I was being really nitpickety or whatever. But um, eventually they got it to a stage where it was as detailed as they could, you know, within limits because they're used to making larger simplified pieces. And God, would I love to be able to do large and simplified but I get dragged down into detail. You know, like I am one of those people that in my head, I go over stuff like tonight I'll be thinking, oh, I should have said this, I should have said that, oh, I shouldn't have said the other. It's the way I'm wired and it's not a good wiring way. I don't like it. But um, <laughs> I have been asked by a gallery to do a life-size piece and I would love to do it. The challenge is, of course, what to make that life-size piece in first before because the media that I use for these pieces is very expensive and very difficult. I can only make small quantities at a time and it has a 15 minute working window. So I have to work in small little pieces. And during the winter time, it's really difficult to mix because it's colder and I have to heat it up in order because my hands aren't great. You know, like I've got problems with arthritis these days. 
God damn it. But um, yeah, me <laughs> material. I'm, I am, look at, I can go from one side of the room to the other and in the space of that journey, that hobble, I lose a piece of myself, it'll fall off. I'm, I feel I'm at that stage in my life. Nobody told me when you hit 50, pieces start falling off right, left and center and they don't go back on. It sounds like you kind of, you took a screw the system approach when it came to founding your initial works. And it sounds like communication was maybe the biggest challenge, just the, the nature of how direct you had to be. I'm, um, COVID-19 was perfect for me. I thought, hallelujah, the whole world is now living my life. I, it was only in the last two years that I was forced to go out and mix and mingle at exhibitions that I had to turn up to and um, you know wear this mask and this disguise and feel anxious and nervous and that forced connectivity made me kind of have to interact more but I'm back in my element now this excuse to not have to go out and talk to people and when you're isolated for long enough it's very difficult to get back into being able to talk and communicate I'm here chatting to you purely because Noel has been nurturing and Rosie, the people up in the north have been a lifesaver for me in the world of art. They love my work up there. You know, it's like you have to travel outside of where you're from before your work is seen because they don't know who you are and they only see the work. Sheridan, I think you had a question. Yeah, thank you. I just had a quick question. Can you hear me? Am I muted or anything? You're good. You're good. Oh, I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, I loved it. So grateful to, uh, what a great joy to, to see this wonderful work. My question is um, scale. I see behind you uh, a scale model, and then uh, you talked about doing a life size scale. So that's my question. What is your current scale? Is it, what is, what is the dimension? Let's see. Currently, I'm working on a piece that is, I suppose, about that size. Perhaps, Helen, if you brought it over to the camera, actually, the, to see the original pieces, that might help Sheridan in saying the size. They're like 12 to 24 inches, roughly. Well, I think these could work great. Yeah, yeah about, about two about two foot in height would be the largest that I'm working on at the moment. And I'm working on a piece as well that has been going on. This is the fourth year that I'm working on it. It's a twin piece, <laughs> twins and a horse. And it has evolved very slowly over the, the four years. So that'll tell you, like, it takes a lot for things to germinate and for you to see clearly. You, no amount of sketching can tell you what it's going to be like, you know, way down the line and what you read, the message you want to show. So, um, yeah, two foot is the highest that I'm working currently, but I don't know what materials to work with in order to make them life size. You know, I know myself, I'll have to do casts, but the material that I use currently, the resin is far too difficult and expensive, not practical at all for making a life size piece. And then the life size piece before it's cast, the actual, like my ones that were cast, the originals are still all in shape and, you know, unique and in good condition. They're still pieces in their own right. Whereas if you're doing a life-size piece, the original that you do would be discarded or, you know, cut up in the foundry in order for them to do their job. So I don't want to use a material that's so expensive and difficult to work with. I just have to figure out what that material will be. Helen, Thank you. Maybe one last question or comment, and and then I'm afraid we'll have to go. Susan, can I just say? Can I just say? And I I know it wasn't there for the beginning because of the, the problems here with connection, but um, I have to say I have got to know Susan or got to know Helen and her husband Paul probably really well over this last two two three years, and I have to say that easily. And I've worked with quite a number, probably hundreds of artists over the years. Um, she is easily the most prolific artist that I have seen of her time in terms of her technique, her discipline, her, um, her narrative. Um, I, I drove down to her, her studio, which took me about five hours drive and drove straight back up on the same day. 
with such excitement and enthusiasm. And I am such a, so pleased and so proud to hear you talk with such confidence about your work. It is inspirational. And th the challenges that you pose, not just to yourself, but to the foundries and to the art world, I don't think they're even ready for them yet. And I really look forward to this, um, this, these challenges continuing. Both Rosie and Helen and myself are going to be joining a broadcast tomorrow looking at artists in lockdown. And artists thrive, I think, in isolation and indeed need it. But I think it's the support, Susan, that you give, the connections of all of the, the participants here today and the opportunities for continuously us, give us an opportunity to connect and support each other because it's only with practice and opportunity and connection and support that we can grow and thrive. So today has been a perfect example of that. And I am so proud of Helen and so proud of Paul. And this has just been brilliant. So thank you very much. Noel, Noel I have to say that I never spoke outside of my own four walls, my own studio, about what my work was about until you came into my life. And I spent quite a while trying to, you know, um, not engage and be minimal because I didn't know what to say. But thankfully, you kept making contact. And, you know, over the last two years, I can't even believe that I'm sitting here talking about my work like this. And that it's been, you've, you've given me, like my piece, the other piece, the building blocks, the stages that have gotten me to this stage to be able to actually talk about my work and, and put words to what I, I'm seeing or making because I would not be great with the English language. I'm not great with the written word. Um, you know, being an artist, I always hoped that we could make our piece and just put it out there. And that was it. Our job was done. We could hide away and keep working away. But, you know, to find out that we have to go out there and bloody well tell people what to think, it <laughs> kills me. So, well, it, the thing Susan, is you that, haven't, I, I'm not sure, Susan, whether, or, uh, whether Helen has said, um, because I'm going to argue with her over this. Helen is also an, an arts educator and has taught for years and mentored young people many years, many of whom have inspired, I have no doubt, her work. And I'm, con I'm conscious that a lot of, lots of young people resonate with the work. And the work is not just seen as something sad, but something very, very joyful, very creative, and very, very imaginative. And I think, Helen, I'm not going to get, let you off with that. Um, you have been an arts educator for years. You've been a moderator and an examiner and an example of how to do your job. And I just think that you should now look at this as another launch pad and another opportunity to give yourself a clap in the back. Um, I'm not going to, you saying you're not good with words and you're not good with language, bullshit. That's not good enough. <laughs> you're way ahead, girl. You're way ahead. It's very different if you're trying to explain your own work as a, an educator and a teacher. I could talk four legs off a donkey in a classroom with children. No problems. Um, but when you start talking about your own work, especially when it's emotional, I tend to kind of, you know, forget to move on and disassociate myself from sadness element and I need to talk more in order to get past that emotional softness that I've got you know but thank you Noel I shall take that thank Anybody you Helen. thank you Helen for such Thanks. a beautiful presentation and I know we all enjoyed it I've recorded it I hope that's all right with you that we can share it with perfect us. Okay, okay. So thank you everyone. And it was such a wonderful presentation, Helen. You're, you're an amazing Yay. artist. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank Helen. You, Susan, thank, thank you, you very Mark. much. Susan. Thank you to Paul. Thank you to Paul. Her oh, Paul. Thank you to my technician. This would Paul not have happened. Paul, get into the picture. Thank you. Um, Paul. Hey. Thank you. Bye. Okay, goodbye. Thank everyone. You. Thank you. Bye-bye.